<clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, humans contain 70% of water. Their brains contain 90% of water. How come they know so little about the role of water in the life support system? This is what I'm going to speak about. I'll start by speaking about water and the life support system from a general aspect. <clears throat> the planet Earth is the only planet in the solar system where water can exist both as liquid as ice and as vapor. Here you have a diagram showing the a number of different, different uh, stars. We have temperature on the horizontal axis and pressure on the vertical axis. And <coughs> Mars is too long, far away from the sun, so water can only exist as ice. <coughs> Venus is too close to the, to the sun, so water can only exist as water vapor. Planet Earth is the only one where water can exist as both ice, liquid, and vapor. And there are, of course, the, uh, bad large um, um, energy um, amounts which are involved in water changing from ice to liquid water to vapor. And that is a reason why we can live here on this planet. <coughs> what <coughs> the water cycle is what makes life possible here. <coughs> this diagram shows the water circulation from atmosphere to the land, to the ocean, and back to the atmosphere. On the land, the precipitation supports plant production, returning the water consumed as vapor back to the atmosphere. Remaining water forms runoff, feeding the river system. The vegetation forms terrestrial ecosystems, providing society with ecological services. And the water in the river system supports aquatic ecosystems before emptying into the sea. From there, <coughs> the water evaporates and generates new, generate, new precipitation. While passing the land, water is being withdrawn for societal water uses, domestic, industrial, and agriculture. And during use, part of that water is being consumed and evaporates, and the remainder goes as return flow, polluted back to the river. But there is a global water circulation also across the atmosphere, because over land, the atmosphere is in constant contact with the underlying land, taking up evaporation, feeding the wind system with vapor. And further downwind, this vapor condensates and forms precipitation over the land area, generating downwind rainfall. This means that land use changes and industrial air pollution upwind <coughs> may influence downwind rainfall. And this is what happened with industrial air pollution from the United Kingdom and Poland and causing severe damage to lakes in Scandinavia in the 1980s and 90s and to forests in Central Europe. There are large hydroclimatic differences between the different regions of the world. This map shows you the difference between precipitation and evaporative demand, or thirstiness of the atmosphere. Plus signs indicate that the precipitation is larger and runoff is produced, while minus signs indicate an arid climate where evaporative demand dominates and most of the rain evaporates, limiting the runoff. As you can see, both North America and South America and Europe and Northern Asia are dominated by plus signs, which means that they are humid, whereas Australia and Africa are different and dominated by minor signs. So these two are the continents with arid climates. 
Now, the difference between humid and arid climates is important to understand, and I demonstrate this here with three containers. They are two meter high and placed in three different places, all with the same rainfall, 1,000 millimeter. The left container stands in southern Scandinavia, where the evaporative demand amounts to 500 millimeter. When starting our experiment, there is one meter of rainfall of water in the container. The first year, we get 1,000 millimeter of, <coughs> of rainfall, while evaporation consumes 500. So there is, there is half a meter left <coughs> to, fi to fill the, uh, the container. The container contains one and a half meter after that year. And the second year, the same thing, 1,000 millimeter of rainfall was added while 500 millimeter vanished. The container overflows. The mid-container stands in southern Europe, where the evaporative demand is 1,000 millimeter. The first year, 1,000 millimeter is added with the rainfall, while evaporation consumes 1,000 millimeter. So the water level remains the same. And the second year, the same thing. The water level remains constant. Then we go to the third container, which stands in eastern Africa, where the evaporative demand is 1,500 millimeter. The first year adds 1,000 millimeter of rainfall, but now 1,500 millimeter is consumed, so the water level decreases in the container. And the second year, the same thing. <coughs> the last water in the container is consumed, and the container is empty. This experiment de demonstrates the hydroclimatic differences produced by evaporation demand. The differences in hydroclimate are reflected here in huge differences in human life support situations in different river basins. The evaporative demand creates hydroclimate differences, <coughs> as demonstrated here. You can see the size of the different water flows in and out from the, from the uh, basins. The left one is in the boreal forest zone, and there um, and no, uh, the rainfall is typically 600 millimeter. But <coughs> But uh, out of this 600 millimeter, a, a certain amount evaporates, uh, evaporates um, in evaporation, so the runoff, a typical runoff, is 380 millimeter. The mid basin is in the semi arid tropical zone <coughs> and gets the same amount of rainfall as we get in Sweden, the 600 millimeter but it has an evaporative demand which is three times as high. So the result is that practically all rain evaporates, leaving <coughs> only 100 millimeter of runoff that escapes the, the evaporation. The right-hand humid tropical basin has the same evaporative demand as the Arizona, but now several meters of rainfall leaves enough water to meet <coughs> both the giant evaporation, 1,500 millimeter, and an enormous runoff, <coughs> as, uh, as exemplified by the Amazon and the Congo rivers. The mid-river basin, the arid one, represents the situation where we have today the majority of the poor and undernourished, all together some one billion people, depending on severely water-constrained agriculture production. These problems linked to dry land agriculture explain the global map of remaining regions with problems of economic development and hunger. The arid continent Africa dominates the world map, as you can see, in terms of hosting the regions where both undernutrition 
and rate of population growth culminates. <clears throat> These facts have been strong motivation for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal Agenda, listing 17 goals to be achieved by 2030. And two of these goals are precisely focused on hunger and poverty, as we can see, as exemplified by these maps. No, oh, sorry, I missed this. Excuse me. You can see the, the dominance of, 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 of hunger and poverty on the world map. It is Africa which is remaining with high levels of these two characteristics. If we proceed <coughs> and look at what happens to the rain when it hits the land, it is partitioned in two branches, green and blue water respectively. A green water branch that infiltrates into the soil and evaporates back to the atmosphere and a blue water branch of runoff in rivers and aquifers. There are two partitioning points in the soil, as you can see by the stars. One is the partitioning in the soil surface between surface runoff and infiltration, and the, uh, the next partitioning point is in the root zone, where part of the water is taken up by the roots and the rest percolates downward. In this way, the rain is partitioned into a green water branch returning water into the atmosphere and a blue water branch of water runoff above and below the ground. Similarly, the river basin partitioning distinguishes between two types of water. In the landscape, the runoff generation takes place within a water divide, that is the re red line around this basin. All rain which falls within that divide is partitioned into blue water runoff and green water <coughs> passing through the soil and returning to the atmosphere. City water is taken in from the river system and the surplus is returned back as wastewater. And the same happens within industry, the wastewater being returned as more or less polluted wastewater to the river system. Irrigated agriculture takes in irrigation water from the river system, consuming part of it while the surplus goes as return flow back to the river system. So the downstream societies in the river basin have to suffer from all the pollution added upstream and a wise water resources management has to integrate all these parallel influences on the water system. That was a general introductory, introductory part. Then I go, I, I proceed to the blue water scarcity, which has been my particular interest since the 1980s. <coughs> We, what I want to, see, to understand is the, 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 the differences in blue water scarcity. And I started with my interest in water crowding, how many people share each flow unit of water. <clears throat> I gave this the name water crowding, which increases as demonstrated in this diagram where each cube contains one million cubic meter of water per year as, as the passing water. Each dot is 100 person. So the cubes show you how water crowding increases with increasing population. When I introduced this scale in the 1980s, most of the industrialized countries, they were in interval two, between 100 and 600 people per flow unit. But by 600 people per flow unit, I could see that things started to get complicated due to water scarcity. And by 1,000 people per fuel unit, 
there was evidently a chronic water scarcity. Israel uh, was at that time at 2,000, <coughs> and they called that level the water carrier. And this is the, a concept, this water cloudum is a concept that has been picked up internationally and goes under the connotation Falkenmark indicator. But blue water scarcity has also another component. <clears throat> One component is the water demand-driven water scarcity, <clears throat> which is shown on the vertical axis here. <clears throat> this is spoken of internationally as water stress. And 40% water stress is considered severe water stress. Now, this, uh, this uh, uh, diagram has logarithmic axes in both directions. On the crowding axis, 1,000 people, that is the, the horizontal axis, 1,000 millimeter, 1,000 people per flow unit is where water shortage starts to become chronic shortage. So, <coughs> so we have four different situations in this diagram. The diagonal lines show you the possible water use in every point of the diagram. When there is, at the same time, high water stress up in other words, the yellow area in the diagram, and chronic shortage, the pink area in the diagram, then things become critical. And we speak of severe water shortage. This is the brown diagram up here. And today, I recently got data from, from uh, Helsinki <coughs> with the information that we now have 1.1 billion living in the brown area in this diagram. So things are getting complicated with water supply in those areas. Turning now to water pollution, the concentration in a water body of a certain pollutant depends on the dilution offered by the river flow. So it can therefore, be, in fact, be analyzed with the same water crowding thinking, since the cubes show also the number of people polluting every flow unit. That's what I'm going to say about blue water. Now we turn to, to green water, focusing on the core resource in the dry lands. In other words, the dry climate regions <coughs> where much of the rain evaporates before reaching any river. Kenya's water balance illustrates the Achilles heel of the arid climate where most of the rain evaporates. <coughs> most of the available water is therefore the green water in the soil supporting the plant production, the green on this diagram. And only a limited amount of water generates blue water in rivers and aquifers, as shown by the thin blue lines at the bottom. The it, Kenya's water balance <coughs> demonstrates the challenge of water resources management in arid climates. Evidently, most water in Kenya is simply the green water in the soil, and an agricultural revolution in Africa will be completely different from the one in Southern Asia, which was a blue revolution based on irrigated agriculture made possible by the Himalaya and the enormous amounts of water running down from Himalaya feeding <coughs> the, uh, the uh, Asian uh, river, uh, rivers. But the water used in global food production is not at all as conventionally discussed in agriculture, irrigation water. 
most of the water used in agriculture in the, in the world is in reality the green water in the soil. This diagram shows you the percent of green water used in different regions of the world in the green areas, whereas the blue areas are the areas where, where, more, where more than 50% water, of the water is blue water. So we have had completely different, uh, completely wrong idea about the water in agricultural production in the past. <coughs> Let us therefore look closer on dryland agriculture. As part of my lecture, I drew the attention to the fact that Africa is the world continent where hunger dominates. In the semi-arid regions, agriculture is, however, possible, although the rain suffices only to very low yields of the order of only one ton per hectare in sub-Saharan Africa. Field research has however, has, however, revealed that there are enormous water losses, <coughs> which suggests that increased yields would in fact be possible, and information of enormous importance for the world's future in view of the ongoing population growth on this arid continent. The water losses <coughs> to the atmosphere are due <coughs> to crop roots damaged during frequent dry spells, with the effect that the roots are only able to pick up less than 30% of the soil available in the root zone, whereas the rest has evaporated as an enormous water loss to the atmosphere. This contributes to the very low agriculture yields in dryland agriculture. Finally, I will, I will um, report a, a recent study we have made in, in, in Stockholm Resilience Center on the global outlook on the life support system, looking at the, of the future of the life support system. We have been studying the implications of water for in the life support system, and we have distinguished between eight different water functions which occupy all in parallel. The three green water functions, respectively regulatory function, which means, for, for instance, production of va water vapor for the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas which keeps the planet 30 degrees warmer than without an atmosphere. Productive <coughs> functions, which involves biomass production and food production. And moisture feedback, which is involved in generating new precipitation. These are the three green water functions. In addition to that, we have five blue water functions, respectively societal water supply, carrier of nutrients and pollutants, the formation of water masses, production, and aquatic ecosystems. And furthermore, we have a set of different water roles, respectively controlling role, acting um, within and being influenced by the water cycle. Together, all these flows, functions, and roles are closely interacting in an intricate global system and form a dense water-related network involved in building resilience in ecosystems, a requisite for the ability to generate ecosystem services, in other words, benefits that people obtain from ecosystems. <clears throat> in the life support system, all these processes are interacting with ecological processes in the surroundings that they pass, 
building resilience while passing over land, <coughs> and profoundly interacting with these environments. A condition for ecosystems to generate ecosystem services is that it has good resilience, and therefore depending on these interacting critical water processes. <clears throat> so water interacts with both the regulating ecological services, like quality regulation and biomass growth, and the provisional ecological services, like production of food and timber. Together, the water processes and the ecological services constitute the life support system. A rich archive of historic evidence shows that past land and water mismanagement have resulted in deteriorated water functions. The result is a long array of partial collapses in terms of severe ecosystem collapses and regime shifts, such as savanization of tropical forests, desertification of arid land, river closure of depleted rivers, aquifer depletion where groundwater withdrawals were larger than the natural groundwater formation, and eutrophication of water systems overloaded with nutrients. Such degradations humanity will have to live with, persist in, adapt to, and transform. Societal problems may build up step by step as illustrated by examples such as the Somalian drought, the Cape Town water crisis, and the Arab Spring. In the end, societies may even collapse, as did, for example, the antique Mesopotamian civilization. The question for the next generation to raise is how further future stresses caused by tomorrow's climate change, continued population growth, and increasing human demands will continue to disturb the life support system and its interactions between water flows, functions, and roles, and the relevant ecological processes like food production, timber production, and biodiversity. The critical question to pose, to focus on, will be keeping the planet in the present favorable Holocene-like conditions with relatively stable climate by safe navigation of the life support system. What transformations will be needed? What shifts in governance approaches in terms of scope, scale, and speed will be required? And how can that be done? Thank you.